Segment 20, Kirchhoff's Laws. We're doing things a bit backwards here in the sense that Kirchhoff discovered these rules totally empirically by studying objects in a laboratory setting, but we've started from the point of view of black bodies and atomic spectra first and are now coming to the empirical laws. But these laws are very handy in a, as a framework for understanding what we're looking at when we look at emission from objects. So it's useful to do it in this order. What Kirchhoff said was that if you look at an opaque object that's hot, what you'll see is a continuous spectrum. So we know this opaque object is a black body. A black body emits at all wavelengths without any interruption. So you get a continuous spectrum, a rainbow, from it. If you look at a diffuse gas, what you see instead is a set of emission lines. This is, for example, emission from tra atomic transitions in a, in a thin gas, showing the jumps from one state to another. When you combine the two, when you have a continuous uh, emitter with a gas in front of it, then what you see are a set of absorption lines. And this we understand as the gas taking out the photons at a certain wavelength corresponding to energy differences in the atoms and the gas and re-emitting it in random directions so it doesn't come towards our telescope, removing light from the continuous source then at those particular wavelengths so that we see dark lines, lines with less intensity at those particular wavelengths corresponding to the particular energies of the transitions. So here's a summary slide showing all three cases at once. You see the hydrogen emission spectrum from the glowing gas, you see the continuous spectrum from the uh, opaque source, and you see the hydrogen absorption spectrum as you look at the opaque source through the uh, absorbing gas. So when solids are, em are heated, they emit at all wavelengths. That's our, our black body. And how bright they are at different wavelengths depends on the temperature of the solid. That's the Stefan Boltzmann law. And hot hotter so, uh, solids emit more light at all wavelengths, but they emit especially more light at short wavelengths in the blue and violet. That's a result of Wien's law. When gases are heated, they emit only at certain wavelengths. That's the emission line spectrum because the collisions or excitation of the gas leads to transitions between different energy levels that, that are only certain energies. And different gases emit at different wavelengths. So here again is our continuous spectrum, and we see the black bodies that we saw before, noting that the cooler one is emitting more in the red, and the hotter one is emitting more in the blue. When we look at the absorption spectrum by placing a gas in front of this black body, then we see something like this. This is a, a, a solar spectrum now spread out all the way from the blue to the red at very high dispersion. And we see it's got the colors of the rainbow, but in addition, a series of black lines. So why are there so many lines? There are many lines because the sun has many, many different elements in its atmosphere. And each one creates a set, a unique set of lines that appear in this spectrum. Some lines are fat and other lines are skinny. That has to do with the strength of the lines and also with where they form within the atmosphere. The thicker lines are stronger lines from more abundant elements, and they happen to be forming in a part of the atmosphere where the pressure is higher. So here we have a spectrum showing hydrogen lines, and plotted below is the, the, the kind of intensity versus wavelength plot I've talked to you about before, and this has continuum because there's a, an opaque object, the, the center of the star is opaque, and then the atmosphere of the star has more diffuse gas in it with hydrogen in it that can absorb at these particular wavelengths and scatter the lights, the light out of the uh, particular direction in which we're looking. Here's an illustration of stars of different temperatures showing the hydrogen part of the spectrum. And you'll notice here that the very cool star has very weak lines, the very hot star has very weak lines, but the stars in between, between say 7500 and 10,000 degrees, have quite strong lines. So why does this happen? The secret is, is that the lines that we see in the visible wavelength are the so-called Balmer lines that come from the 
level 2 and jump up from there in absorption. The Lyman lines come from the ground state, and so cool gas has most of its atoms in the ground state, and you'd see very strong Lyman lines. But until the gas gets hot enough, there are very few atoms with electrons in that level 2, in the first excited state, and so the lines are weak. When the gas gets hot enough, that state becomes heavily populated and the gas can absorb very effectively from that state to higher states. As you make the gas too hot, then many of the atoms will be in even higher states or even be ionized due to collisions and those lines get weaker again. And that leads to this optimal temperature of around 8,000 degrees where those lines are strongest. Here's a picture of a, an interstellar cloud, and you'll notice it has this characteristic red color. What kind of spectrum would we expect to see from an interstellar cloud? Well, the kind of spectrum we'd expect to see is a, an emission line spectrum, because this is a diffuse gas, and in fact, most of the gas here is hydrogen, and this reddish color you're seeing is due to transitions between the third state of hydrogen and the second state. This is H-alpha, uh, the, the main Balmer line from hydrogen that makes this very characteristic color in the nebula. 